Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you who are visiting with us on TV today. We thank you for those who are tuning in. We've noticed that uh, we have some uh, of our worships have 50, 53 uh, viewers, so keep viewing. Or if you have the opportunity and you live in the area, come and join us here at Grace Lutheran on the Loop and worship with us. The first song, as I said, tis good Lord to be here. Let's begin with that. Rise on the last verse. Let us begin in the name of the only true God, the triune God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And I Almighty God, I have poor and miserable sin, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee, and justice deserved my temporal and eternal punishment. And I am heartily sorry for them, and, them. and I pray thee of thy bounteous mercy, for the sake of the holy innocent mother suffering and death, of thy beloved Son Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Now, upon this, your confession, I, by the virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of God's word, I announce his grace to you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. For they will soon fade like the grass. And wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell the land Delight yourselves in the Lord. And he will give you the of your Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust be, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him.
Glory be to God on high. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully grant that by your power we may be defended against all adversity. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 3 through 9. Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the days of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a a fast, and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I chose? To loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your home? When you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light Break forth like the dawn, and your healing <clears throat> shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be <clears throat> your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer you. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting with the first verse. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not proclaim to you the testimony of God, which lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not a plausible word of wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your fight, faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among you the mature we do not impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and wisdom, hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of your glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it, as it was written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, 
what God has prepared for these who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. A natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. gospel for this Sunday, this fifth Sunday after the Epiphany, is recorded in the gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter beginning with the 13th verse. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer <coughs> good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good work and Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not a iota nor a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes is one of these least of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us together confess our faith through the words of the creed as we find it in our service bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, Please be seated and let us turn to our service hymn.
God's grace and his peace be with each of you this day through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're not like uh, some churches. We only have one camera. And when we switch where I'm standing for the sermon, we have to do everything manually. Uh, it's not like you're pushing a button and going from camera one to camera two to camera three. And so it uh, takes a while to get it set up. In the epistle lesson, it talks about love. Love is the essential byproduct of our faith in Jesus Christ. Faith produces works. And love is a work of that faith. But I want to remind you a little bit about love because mm, love has lost its meanings over the years, especially in English. Okay, um, Agape, agapeo, are used in the New Testament to describe the love or to express the love that God shows to his son and to us. It is a very special love that pours out virtues that go beyond that that people are used to dealing with in their everyday lives. It is that kind of love that moved Jesus to go to the cross for us. It's used to describe the attitude of God towards his son in John 17, to the human race generally in John 3, 16. You know it, right? Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever, yeah, did I first say, whoever would believe will not perish, but have everlasting life. The same thing in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love, that very special agape love, for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is through this kind of love that Christ is manifested or made known to us, to the believers and that's a very special aspect of love. But this agape is used to convey also God's will to his children concerning their attitude one towards another and towards all men, as in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, and in 2 Peter. It is also used to express the essential nature of God, as in 1 John 4, 8. Who does not, whoever does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. So agape is a very special expression of love towards us. It goes, it goes beyond what most humans are capable of. And it shows an attitude that wishes to follow after Christ and accomplish those works that God has placed before us. Now, the second use of the word is phileo. Now, phileo love, that's the way it's translated, is to be distinguished from agape in this. Phileo represents tender affection. It does not represent that specific outpouring of godly love towards him or towards others. When Jesus confronted Peter after the resurrection, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Then he asks him a second time, Peter, do you love me? Peter again says, yes, I love you. There doesn't seem to be any difference in the English. He asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. And Jesus said to Peter, go and feed the sheep. The first two times, Jesus uses agape. Peter uses phileo. 
Do you love me, Peter, the way I love you? I went to the cross for you. I suffered for you. I paid the price for your sins. Do you love me that way? And Peter says, I have affection for you. Okay? Twice he does this. The third time Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Jesus doesn't use agape. He uses phileo. In other words, Peter, if all you have for me at this point is an affection, all right, you go and feed the sheep. Jesus accepted Peter where he was. And that's the wonderful thing about that agape love that Jesus expresses. Because Christ accepts you where you are. Where you are. Well, there's a third kind of love, and that's the love that a husband is supposed and a wife is supposed to have for each other. It's called eros. It is a word that is never used in the New Testament for love. So we deal with just those two words, agape and phileo. God expressed an outpouring of his love for us. And his son fulfilled his father's will and died for us. That's agape love. So we're going to talk about that mainly. And there are three things that we need to realize about this love that we should have for God. First, the value of love. Secondly, the virtue of love. And then thirdly, the victory of love. Love is extremely important. Faith produces love. The value of love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, it talks about the worth, the value of that love that God has for us and the love that we should have for him. And it talks about all the blessings that God gives us. But at the end it says, but if I have not love, what does it profit? Nothing at all. Without the love of Christ in me, no blessings that I receive profit me. Oh, I may have wealth. But what good does it do if I don't use that wealth through the love I have for God, for the blessings that he has given me, to bless others? Love has value. The value of love is beyond estimation. No gift or possession is profitable without it. Nothing that God gives to you is worth anything without love attached to it. One year, I took my daughter out, uh, and it was before Christmas, and the church I was serving gave me a stack of $20 bills. And I would roam the streets of Chico, and I'd go in behind the stores, and I would find homeless people. And we would give them $20 so that they could get food. Now we prayed and we hoped that that's what they got. Okay? But we have to trust sometimes. So the expression of love was the gift with no strings attached to it. We had the wealth and we offered it in love to others. But we didn't just do it at Christmas. We did it at other times of the year as well. When we went to Whittier on Wednesday, we would go and buy hundreds of burritos, heat them up, bag them up with a piece of fruit, some candy, and a drink, and we would go out 
in my van and distribute this to the day workers. And they knew we would be coming and they would wait and they would take that gift and they'd take it to work with them. And you could see day workers working on sites and you could see the bags all lined up. That love expression changed many of their lives. We had to believe that. So the value of love goes beyond what we estimate. It can change a life forever. Okay, secondly, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul compares the superiority of love to the gift of languages, prophecy, Miraculous faith, that kind of faith can move what? Can move mountains. And the doing of sacrifice and good deeds. What's more important? It's important that you do good works, but what's more important is is that you do it with love. You don't do it to earn something. You do it to show others the love of Christ in you. Thirdly, we must recognize the value of love also, for God's love enables us to do his work effectively. God is love, and the more like him we become, the more love we will possess. Now this is extremely important. Your attitude towards others is extremely important. Not towards your family, although that is important, but to those who are outside of it. To those who are cold and freezing in the streets. Those who are without food, without rent, without a place to lay their heads. God's love reaches out to them. Yes, the poor are always going to be with us, Jesus says. But how we love and show God's love to them is important. Not just for our well-being, but for theirs as well. Okay, secondly, the virtue of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now, the virtue of love includes kindness, humility, selflessness, patience, compassion, faith, And it it includes that below type of love as well. How you show this to those around you is an expression of Christ within you. And to love is the most important thing in the life of a Christian in their outreach work for the lost who truly need to hear the gospel. If you approach somebody and put them down or angry with them, what are you doing here? You don't belong in this country. You're a foreigner. How are you going to be able to bring the gospel message to that person? And that's something that people in the churches seem to forget. Many people are trying to express the virtue of love without the possession of love. This is impossible to do. They want to show that they are loving people, but the motive behind their outpouring of love is self-serving, not God-serving. And that's the difference in how they show their love to others. 
there was a multi, multi, multi millionaire. Actually, it was close to a billion dollars. It was his net worth. And he gave a million dollars to a hospital. That was his donation that year. How much is a million to a billion? One percent? Yeah. But he was touted as being an outstanding giver. A million is a lot. For me, it's more than I would see in a lifetime. But for him, nothing at all. He was happy. He got a plaque with his name on it. It went right up at the top of the heap. The motive was to be recognized. Oh, look how good he is. Now, I'm happy he gave the million dollars. It's a million that they didn't have. But a tithe of that would have been what? A hundred million dollars. That would have been an outpouring of love. But you know what most of his friends would probably say to him at that point? That he was crazy. What do you mean you're giving a hundred million dollars to a hospital? Without the love of God moving in our lives, we cannot possess the love that truly receives the benefits of what God gives to us. Welch, as I've told you about him, was a good example of that. Welch's gave 90% to the church and kept 10% for himself. He blessed the church purely out of love for his Savior and for his church. We must possess the Spirit of Christ if we are to succeed in performing the work of Christ. Being filled with the Holy Spirit enables us to practice the virtues of love. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to do what Christ has called us to accomplish. To do good works that the Father has already provided for us to do. The Holy Spirit works through us, moves within us, converts us, and fills us with the love of Christ so that we in turn can show that love to others. Now, lastly, the victory of love. And now those three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest is love, because love covers, the next verse says, a multitude of what? A multitude of sins. Loved ones, friends, pleasure, and possessions, well, they fail. But the love of God never fails. And that's that agape love. That's the love that moves us to reach out with God's love to help change lives. Faith pleases God. Faith serves its purpose in this life by how it shows love. How do you show love to other people? I, 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 I've heard people on their phones swearing at people, using such vile and vulgar language, using racist epitaphs, and they turn around and they're wearing a cross. What kind of a witness is that? How does your faith show your love for those around you? It is illegal to come into this country without a visa. And there are illegal people here. But 
They are here. How do we reach out with the love of God to help them? You see, that's where the rubber meets the road here. Although they are illegal, although we know they shouldn't be here, they are. How do we help? That's when our love really gets tested. Look at what Jesus said. The poor are always going to be with us. How do we show love for them? Not an easy question, is it? But we have to examine ourselves and admit that we aren't always as loving as we should be. But we do have an advocate with the Father, and that's Jesus Christ. And we have forgiveness. But we pray also to amend our sinful ways. And we do what we can to help them. Children shouldn't be sick and starving. Neither should their parents, even if they are illegal. Even if they are illegal. They need our love. Love is a necessity. Everyone needs to love and be loved. Love is eternal. It will unfold in greater beauty and glory while endless ages roll by. Victory is assured those who are filled with God's love. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Now, I'm not telling you to go give people money. But if you see somebody in need, go buy them Big Mac. I had one individual come to us for help. And one of my sim brothers had a, a mantra. One hour work, one sandwich. Two hours work, two sandwiches. And I told him, you know, we need things cleaned up around here after the storm, one hour, $10, two hours, $20. And he worked and worked and worked. He didn't want a handout. He asked if there was anything he could do to earn money because of the situation he was in. The next day he came back. Well, there's the street. It's got stuff, garbage in it. Clean it up. And he did. And he was so appreciative of being allowed to earn that which we were willing to give. It made him joyous and happy. It was a blessing to him, a blessing to us, and a blessing to our community. And this is the way we worked in these areas. And people knew that they could get help from us. And they knew it was because of the love we had for Christ. And that's the important thing. How we express our faith through love. So I've got in closing, one question to ask you, and you can answer it to your heart and by your heart. How do you show love to others? Amen. I'm going to ask you to rise for prayer. God of grace, we look to you at this time, trusting in you, in the hope that your love will never be withheld from us, but will always be foremost in your dealings with us, so that we, as we exemplify you through our life, 
can show love to others. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our shut-ins. We ask, Lord, that you bless them, that you strengthen them and preserve them, that you keep them in your love and care. Gracious Father, make their day one of joy. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for our church, Give our leaders of both a full measure of your love so that they in turn can show that to others. Let our church, its leaders and members, have a true heart for outreach. Our job is not to determine who should be here and who shouldn't. Our responsibility is to bring Jesus to the nations to the people around us and those that we come in contact with, no matter who they are. Lord, in your mercy, our national leaders are there to serve us, to protect those who live in this nation without adverse desires to tear it down. There are many ways that people are led in this world. This country has a way. Let our national leaders serve as they have been elected to serve, to honor the office we've placed them in. Lord, in your mercy, for those who are healing, for Billy Turner, for Brent, for Steve, for Coy's nephew Travis, who is in remission, for Reverend Tom Wagstaff, Gene Stennett's son-in-law, who has cancer. Bless and keep them, Lord, and strengthen them. Be with Brian, who is to have a brain MRI, and Irene, who is recovering from wrist surgery. And Melanie, who is having problems with her back, as well as her cousin Jonathan, who had a stroke. We pray for David Mikey, for the headaches that he's having, and for Stephanie, Brian's and Linda's daughter, who has a brain tumor. Lord, place your hand of healing and strengthening on them. Lord, in your mercy, for Dottie, who is to have surgery in the, this week, to replace two vertebrae in her neck and to put a plate into her neck to hold it together. Lord, guide the surgeon's hand and let this be a successful surgery. Lord, in your mercy, for Charlotte, who has a birthday on the 11th, bless this child with your grace and your love. We pray for her parents, who are both in the military and our other military members and family, Austin and Brittany, Kay, Marcus, and Nicholas. Strengthen them and make a blessing in their lives, Lord, and keep them safe. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all of those for whom we pray. And we ask, Lord, that you be with Linda Sullivan, who has hip repair surgery coming up in two weeks. Bless her, and through your healing power, help her to recover quickly. And be with us as we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father... The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 